Hello and welcome to our 2023 Earth Day webinar, Investing in the Planet Through Improved Hazard Resiliency in Water Supply. This webinar has been jointly organized by the American Geosciences Institute and Geoscientists Without Borders, a program of the Society of Exploration Geophysicists that is funded by the SEG Foundation. Geoscientists Without Borders' mission is to support humanitarian application of geoscience knowledge and technology around the world. In today's webinar, we will be hearing about two Geoscientists Without Borders projects that are helping to increase resiliency to geologic hazards in Guatemala and improving potable water access and supply for communities in northeastern Ghana. Our first speaker, Stephen Roche, who is the co-investigator of Hearts in Motion, will discuss how the project he is involved with aims to increase the geohazard resiliency and safety of the communities in Guatemala through implementing community-based educational workshops about earthquake and volcanic hazards, increasing seismic and volcanic monitoring capacity, and reducing disaster response time by implementing a low-cost regional seismic array. Our second speaker, Elie Plim Jukun, who is a lecturer in the Department of Earth Science at the University of Ghana, will discuss the project she is involved with, which aims to improve potable water access and supply for the inhabitants within the Nasia River Basin in northeastern Ghana. She will discuss how the project is informing groundwater management policy decision-making and improving access to potable water resources by the communities in the area. Steve Roach, it's my pleasure to present our Geoscientists the Without Borders project, Increasing Natural Hazard Resiliency in Guatemala. Guatemala is susceptible to several geologic hazards, including volcanoes and earthquakes. 
for example in February of 1976 there was a magnitude 7.2 that ruptured almost 270 kilometers across Guatemala here's some examples of the surface rupture in the Zacapa district uh, as published by George Flatker volcanoes such as volcano Fuego just uh, west of Antigua are highly active and present a danger to Guatemala Our approach for increasing resiliency is primarily through community-based educational workshops and working with Incivime to increase their capacity for seismic and volcanic monitoring capacity. We partner with the regional firefighters and EMT groups since they represent the first responders. We partner with Incivime, the entity responsible for monitoring geohazards in Guatemala, partnering with Universidad San Carlos or USAC in Guatemala City, US and UK based universities, and this is all managed by Hearts in Motion, a US based NGO. Our project has two components seismicity through implementation of a regional seismic array using low cost raspberry shake seismometers, and volcano monitoring primarily on Pacaya with the installation of a new permanent broadband 3C seismometer and infrasound sensor. For our overall project information, we focus on Guatemala, located here in Central America in the map in the upper right. On the left, we show a map of Guatemala showing the existing sensors clustered along volcanoes, or primarily the western part of the country. Triangles in green represent our GWD sensors being implemented. It's a two-year project. It started March 1, 2022. Our Project funding is about $80,000 from Geoscientists Without Borders, evenly split between the two project components, about $70,000 in outside funding, non-GWB, for a total project funding of about $150,000. Project administration is through the US-based NGO, Hearts in Motion. Subproject one is the seismicity along the Polichek Motagua Fault. Our community impact is to increase the community awareness of the geohazards associated with the seismicity, but again, this close alignment with the volunteer firefighters. This photo is uh, uh, in Civame members and volunteer firefighters at the Los Amates site, where we installed a sensor, and this was the epicenter of the 1976 7.2. Project participants are listed on the right, representing Hearts in Motion, the NGO in Guatemala, in Civime, responsible for monitoring seismicity in Guatemala, University of Tulsa, Universidad de San Carlos de Guatemala, and project collaborators Dr. Jake Walter with OGS in Oklahoma, and Dr. Seth Carpenter with KGS in Kentucky. Subproject two is Pacaya Volcano Monitoring, and the objectives here is just to increase resiliency against volcanic hazards from Pacaya Volcano. We want to do this through installing a new station, community outreach, and supporting undergraduate research for two of the students at USAC, which is Universidad San Carlos de Guatemala City. So here's a map view in the, in the lower right, and the, the red box indicates the proposed new sensor location. Community impact is important for monitoring Pacaya. Over 2.4 million people live within 30 kilometers of the volcano, so there's high risk to life and property. So the new monitoring equipment and the workshops will help increase resilience. Project participants are Dr. Michael Barton and graduate student Lindsay Hernandez from Ohio State University, in Sivime, Almirkar Rokar, Dr. Greg Waif, Michigan Technical University, Dr. Watson from Bristol University in the UK, and representatives from Pennsylvania State University and Ohio State University. Project status as of today, for subproject one, the seismicity, all 21 raspberry shake sensors have been purchased, four trips completed for project meetings and sensor deployment. All 21 sensors are deployed and integrated into the Incivime network. Our student intern, David Burrell, started in Incivime on August 1st, and we've held two seismicity outreach events in Tukulakan, Zacapa. For the volcano monitoring at Pacaya, we've held scouting trips for sensor location, 
negotiating the land permits. The sensor has been purchased and is in country and planned to be deployed in May of 2023. Our USAC student internships started first quarter of this year and outreach events are being planned for May of 2023. Regarding data, we're pleased to report that the Raspberry Shake sensors have been integrated into the Incinema network very nicely. This is an example of an earthquake swarm in eastern Guatemala where the Raspberry Shake sensors in orange provided valuable coverage for characterizing this swarm, including delineating the focal mechanisms of several of the larger events. Another aspect of the seismicity project is that the Raspberry Shakes are extremely transportable, allowing Incivime to be very responsive to geohazard situations. In this case, there was an earthquake swarm detected in January of 2023 along the border with, uh, between Guatemala and El Salvador in the Jutiapa district. As soon as the swarm was detected, two Raspberry Shake sensors were relocated to be put in close proximity to the earthquake swarm. The existing network had stations located hundreds of kilometers away. The rapid deployment of the two sensors allowed a much more thorough characterization of the earthquake swarm, such as the distribution of events through January, February, and March of this year. And you can see in the histogram, the two stations on the far right, in close proximity to the earthquake swarm, provided the bulk of the data for characterizing the swarm. Since the Raspberry Shake sensors only need power, and a Wi-Fi connection, they can be rapidly deployed to any site. These are examples of station JUT5 showing the sensor connection to the internet and power and the Asivame staff being able to put the sensor in place and having it up and running and providing data to the Asivame network within minutes. This is a heliograph of the vertical component from station JUT5 for one day, January 19th of 2023, at the height of the swarm, vertical component, this shows a multitude of events, approximately 80 events were recorded by this station on this day. The addition of 21 sensors into the Nzithame network greatly increased their research capability into an earthquake early warning system, or EEWS. On February 2nd, we were visiting the Nzithame touring their control room where they monitor earthquakes and volcanoes. Um, the, the tour was being led by Robin Yanni on the left, Diego Castro Center and David Burrell, our student insert. While we were there in the control room, a magnitude 5.1 earthquake occurred and we were able to see in, in a sense, a test run of the earthquake early warning system. The event on February 2nd was a magnitude 5.1 located just offshore Western Guatemala. And we were able to see the distribution of sensors as they tripped in response to the propagating earthquake waves across Guatemala. And we're just pleased to note that all of the sensor locations, the red triangles are the GWB Raspberry Shake 3C sensors in the project. Now in this case, the event was in the West with the waves propagating to the east. We wanted to prepare for an event such as the 1976 magnitude 7.2 event, which originated from its epicenter in the east, propagating westwards towards Guatemala City. So this was an excellent test and preview of the earthquake early warning system research within Incidame. Our early community outreach events focus on strengthening the tie between hearts and motion the volunteer firefighting community in Incivime. So this is an example of an outreach event that was held on October 13th of last year, where we had a, a, a seminar over lunch where we had presentations from Incivime and various staff on seismicity related geohazard information. As part of the outreach program, Robin Yanni with Incidame explained earthquake early warning system principles. Participants examined the Raspberry Shake sensor unit itself 
and Helen Moran with M7 Lang demonstrated the Raspberry Shake station view tools where participants could log into their station and actually view the data and just get familiar with the instrument itself. So thank you. I look forward to responding to any questions in our Q&A period following the video. Hello, my name is Eli Klim Jipun from the University of Ghana. I'm a lecturer in applied geophysics and I'm also a researcher on the SEG GWB funded project, Provision of Portable Water to Communities in Northeastern Ghana. So today I will take you through a talk which tries to show how this project invests in the planet through improved water supply. And it's really in response to climate change and its attendant problems. So we know that access to water is one of the most impacted areas of climate change, where we see a decrease in accessible quantities and an increase in pollution. So I would like to highlight why groundwater is a good climate adaptation tool and really focus on areas in northeastern Ghana. I must mention that groundwater, though a good adaptation tool, needs to be managed sustainably because it has the risk of being overused and we need to ensure that even as we are using it as an adaptation tool, the resource is not depleted before its time. My presentation will follow this outline. I'll talk you through a bit of the rationale and background of the program or the research. And then I will take you through the technical approach and results, then the social impact. There was a two pronged rationale behind this project, really. The first was to provide clean, portable water for locals and two communities in northeastern Ghana. And the second was to expose students who learn various theoretical aspects of groundwater development. So, from siting to drilling to pumping tests, the various aspects that you go through to get a well functioning. We learn the theory in class, but then how does that translate to real situations on the ground? So this project was really in line with SDGs 4 and 6. However, the focus of my presentation will be on SDG 6, which is clean water and sanitation for all. Recently, the UN Secretary General mentioned that water is really the lifeblood of our world. However, we are currently experiencing heavy pollution and overuse of our fresh water bodies. And this is attributed to a lot of anthropogenic factors. This together with increased temperatures and resultant evaporation rates negatively affects access to clean water. Per the UN's estimations, a quarter of the world's population relies on open streams and ponds for clean water. So can you imagine the gravity of the problem being created? We are polluting these ponds, we are polluting these streams, and the climate is changing, temperatures are on the rise, evaporation rates are increasing. So these streams and ponds are no longer lasting as long as they would. So then we are creating a shortage and people do not have access to water. So there are a number of outcome and implementation targets which define the SDGs. And for SDG 6, we have implementation targets 6.A and 6.B, which are focused on concerted efforts between local communities, governments and international organizations towards achieving the overall goal. In Ghana, we see that these efforts are being championed by government bodies and private entities to improve access to water. Such collaborations have yielded some results, a marginal 7% increase in the space for a period of 11 years. So from 2010 to 2021, we've seen a 7% increase in improved access to water. And these figures are available in the 2022 Ghana Voluntary National Review Report. It shows you that more needs to be done. In that same report, it states that over a fifth of the populations in the northern parts of Ghana lack access to improved drinking water sources. So definitely more needs to be done. I have to, to put everything in context, I need to mention that Ghana has 16 regions. 
and four of these regions in the northern parts carry over 50 percent of the poverty rates so it shows you that access to water is inextricably linked to poverty the poorest people in ghana seem to be those who really lack access to good quality water so the study area is located or the, st the study area is located in the northeastern part of ghana where two communities were chosen to benefit from the SEG GWB project. These communities were chosen because members of the research team had had previous opportunity to visit the area and saw the dire need of the people. So um, mostly they rely on streams which dry up during the dry season or they rely on such hand wells as can be seen here which are easily contaminated by surface material for their domestic um, uses and also sometimes for agriculture but because these um, water resources are limited you realize that outside of the rainy season not a lot of agricultural activities are undertaken so it's important that in order to improve the quality of life of the people and also their economic situation a sustainable source of water needs to be provided so that they'll always have something to rely on so this map just gives you an idea of the two communities they are quite um, apart from each other but then um, their need was severe so that's why the project team decided to work in these communities. This picture here shows you how some women need to travel for miles to other communities or central locations to be able to fetch water. They usually have to queue from morning till um, late afternoon and sometimes they need some tricycles to transport their water back home. Others use bicycles or others just to walk home with the water. So how can a geophysicist invest in their planet, especially through water supply? Geophysics is a tool which helps us to visualize what is below the surface. And groundwater accumulation, groundwater flow happens below the surface. So geophysics presents itself as a good tool to be able to understand groundwater accumulation, groundwater flow, and also to access it. In Ghana, we continue to learn the applications of geophysics and it's given us good successes in many areas and unfortunately the success rates are linked to the geology so we realize that we have higher success rates in certain geologic terrains than others and the voltaic sedimentary basin where the study area is located seems to enjoy not so good a success rate and it really boils down to understanding the geology. The geology within that sedimentary basin is complex and geologists continue to do work to try and improve the understanding. With an improved understanding, interpretation of geophysics will be made better and then our success rates would also increase. But for this project, we relied on 2D electrical resistivity surveys, which maps both the lateral and vertical resistivity variation. And the principle behind that is that with the presence of water, we expect that resistivity signatures will change. So when you have a 2D profile of an area and you see the variations of resistivity, you are able to intelligently deduce whether these are as a result of possible accumulation of water resources or are there the, is there the presence of certain structures that would encourage deposition or accumulation of water resources. So that is why resistivity is a good tool to be used. Now this needs to be backed with a good understanding of the geology. So one thing that this project also sought to do was try and use geophysical tools to improve the understanding of the geology and also have a geologist on site who would look as drilling was done so that, you know, bit by bit, we build on our understanding of the area. And then 
in the long run we would have a repository of information to make interpretation of the fiscal results for groundwater siting and other purposes much easier. So the surveys were done along 400 meter lines because of site constraints. One of the first things that was done was to look for boreholes with successful boreholes which were drilled in similar lithologies quite close to the area and do a sort of calibration on those boreholes. So the results were compared with the results that were obtained from their prospective sites and interpretation of where to actually drill was based on the kind of um, similarities that we saw. So we picked um, drilling points from the pseudo sections that were obtained and those were post by drill. Now, uh, different electrode arrays were used for at each site where uh, an electrical resistivity survey was done. We used the dipole dipole method, the Werner, the Schlumberger. So, those were the three that featured for all the uh, sites that we did to fiscal surveys. And inversion of the data was done using the open source REST IPY software. And this picture shows an example of a profile that was generated and how interpretation was made. So we were working in a siltstone terrain and these are really clay rich. So we tend to try and avoid very conductive areas and try and fit our, our boreholes where we see a transition between a moderately conductive and resistive layer. This is something that we observed from the wells that we calibrated and also from our understanding of the geology in the area. So after the geophysics was done, we drilled the two wells to various depths. Um, the greatest depth was 100 meters, but it's depending on, on, it depended on sites, constraints and where we actually struck good quantities of water. During drilling, there was a geologist on site who loved the chips that were coming out. We would use that information to interpret or to guide interpretation of the borehole logs that were obtained and also do some analysis on the samples and try and link it to the water quality data that will be obtained. So after drilling, construction was done with pipes, PVC pipes to ensure that the wells remain competent and we also installed sanitary packs to ensure that the wells that the water doesn't become contaminated with sediments from the sides of the well so um, after that the next thing we did was to do some borehole logging to help us you know understand to a, a finer degree the rocks that are in the well or the rocks that are below the surface so interpretation of that was done in line with the geologic log to help us really constrain the geophysical signatures that we got from the borehole logs now this data would go into a repository that is being built to improve our understanding of the complex water sedimentary basin. So after the borehole logging was done, the next thing to do was to do a pumping test to determine the yield of the borehole. So that's basically how well does the borehole produce water for the communities. Is it substantial enough for us to install a hand pump for them to use? So we did um, pump some pumping tests there to determine the yields. And the yields were above 10 liters per minute. And the minimum in Ghana required for the installation of a hand pump is 10 liters per minute. So we actually got successful wells to install hand pumps for the communities. So we are yet to finalize the water quality um, analysis from the wells and then based on that we'll determine whether to install the hand pumps without a filtration system or whether we'll need to devise a local filtration system for the communities. Now what has been the impact of this project on the communities? Reliable access to water really has the power to transform communities. 
and when this water supply is closed by it's even better it enhances sustainability so in a community like Zaxlari, where the locals have complained of stomach issues when they use the water and how the water um, reacts when they or how the water affects their food when they use it to cook having a clean portable water source would really reduce the spread of diseases in the community and in Salinria, where this picture was taken you realize that it's the dry season and for as far as your eye can see the all the farmlands are dry and there's really nothing for the people to do so with a closer source of water they would go into all year round vegetable farming which would improve their economic fortunes and also keep them active within the year it also improves the lives of young girls and women because they really bear the brand of lack of access to water they need to walk for miles on end to get water so now that they have a closer source they would probably have the opportunity to invest their efforts in other things hopefully learning a trade or some formal education I'd like to say a big thank you to the Geoscientists Without Borders support um, funded by the SLB. We are grateful for the support extended for us to do this project. We are yet to round up, but we'll soon be rounding up. And then also for the support from the Department of Earth Science, University of Ghana, and for the students really who did a lot of the hard work in the field. Thank you. Well, those were really great talks, Steve and Elik Flim. Thank you so much for sharing um, your expertise with us and all that great information. So we're going to go ahead and move into our discussion session right now. So if you have any questions for these speakers, please go ahead and um, put them in the chat and we'll moderate those out. Um, so my first question is going to be for Steve. Um, can you talk about the frequency of damaging earthquakes and volcanic eruptions in Guatemala and kind of how the um, raspberry shake sensors have improved that uh, response time for early warning? Well, so far at the moment, I mean, the major earthquakes just occur on a decade, decade kind of basis. So this is really a, a looking forward project, particularly with the seismicity, is what can we do now to prepare for the next large events? And this is where in Sivamay's research into an earthquake early warning system is just really key and instrumental. So our part of the project is, uh, with the addition of the Raspberry Shake sensors, is just to augment their array and, and to uh, make it even more widely distributed. On the volcanic side, just because of the proximity of Pacaya to Guatemala City, with uh, about a little over 2 million people living there, is just whatever we can do on that front to provide a better early warning or just to monitor the volcanism is just going to be critical to um, uh, preventing uh, loss of life and damage. Right. Great. Thanks for that. Um, I do have a question for Elik Plim. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the data repository where the where the um, information is going and how much coverage of Ghana is currently in the repository and at what scale? Okay, so um, it's combined efforts. We've had a number of different projects within the larger basin, which is the Voltaic Sedimentary Basin, spanning a number of years and covering different skills. So we've had um, small scale research like what we've done in this project and more larger scale ones where, we've, where they've flown um, airborne through fiscal surveys over the area. So um, a team in the university is just trying to put all the information from the different sources together and then host that repository within the university or within the department so that if there's any need for the information later, we know where and how to access all the information. So it's different skills and it's been hosted in the university and it covers different um, geologic methods. So we have them. Um, field-based data from rock outcrops. Then we have geophysical data from the airborne surveys and more ground-based surveys that we've done and a few borehole surveys that we've done as well. Great, thank you for that. 
Um, while we wait for some questions to come in from the audience, uh, Steve, I was wanting to ask you about the seismic array and how often do those sensors need maintenance? And for the project as a whole, is it considering long-term maintenance and costs to keep the sensor arrays active and continuing to build out that array? It's been, um, I won't call it a pleasant surprise, but I've been very impressed with the Raspberry Shake sensors that were employed. Because um, um, we suffer power outages and, and Wi-Fi downtime type uh, instances quite often. They've been very resilient in terms of uh, having power interruptions and then coming back up to connect to the internet. So we, we use the Raspberry Shake sensors. We put a, a local power supply in place just to protect against surges. But all in all, the array's been remarkably resilient. And um, this is where in, in Sivame's uh, total commitment to the project and collaboration, we Together, we monitor the health of the array, either through some of our staff who are in country with Hearts in Motion or the Incivime group. And so far, there's been relatively few occurrences where we've either had to uh, replace a memory card in the sensor or, or do some major um, retrofit. So once we have the array in place, which we have now, all 21 operating, I think the uh, the, the projection for having it run for years is very good. And, and that's our intent. The duration of the GWD, GWB project is two years, but we're putting in place uh, for uh, continuing on for, for many years. So I've um, been very impressed with the, the Raspberry Shakes. Thanks for that answer. Really appreciate that. Um, I want to turn back to Ellie Plim and trying to get a better understanding of the geology in northeastern Ghana, how, how is that impacting the availability and access to groundwater resources for communities? Because you talk about people will have to travel long distances and um, how, if you can comment on that, how are you also building understanding of the geology within the area for the communities? Okay, so um, the area is within a sedimentary basin. So we have a mix of sandstone, siltstones, mudstones. However, their layout is not too well known. So we are still, in Ghana, we are still building our understanding of the geology in the Voltaic sedimentary basin. The reason being that we focused more on the gold bearing belts and we weren't too interested in the sedimentary basin, but now we are gaining more interest in that. So um, because we do not understand the kind of signatures which would give us water or give us um, success when we drill. You know, it's sort of a, a trial and error thing with a lot of the agents or the contractors who go to drill. One thing that we've noticed is that in many areas, you have to drill quite deep before you can get water. So um, most people would drill to maybe 50, 60 meters. Hardly would you find people going beyond 100 meters. But we realized that um, in order to get good amounts of water, you probably have to go beyond 100 meters. And that, the reason why people don't do that so much is also because of the kind of pumps that we'll be installing. The longer you have to push the pump or the pipes, then you have to do more work to pull the water up. So, you know, it's a bit of um, the technology we have available to draw out the water and then also a lack of um, good understanding of the geology. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. I think there was a second part to the question. No, I think that that answers it very well. We've got some additional follow on questions um, for you. Uh, is enough water being supplied for a sustainable farming solution or would the water from the wells be just for drinking? I know you had talked about potentially um, using the water for agricultural use year round, but can you talk to how do you determine the amount of water available and, and does it support enough for farming throughout the year? Okay, so when we did the pumping test, based on the yields we got, we would have enough water for drinking, cooking, and the rest, and just for a bit of subsistence farming. So you have the individuals in their homes having small gardens. 
there's not enough water to do large scale irrigation farming. And that really also wasn't their purpose for drilling the well. It was more for what they can have at home and then also something to keep them a little busy, not for large scale farming. Thanks for that clarification. Um, back to Steve, um, I wanted to ask you about uh, the decisions and the data that inform the selection of the sensor locations. You know, how long does that take to identify and, and go through all the permitting to get the sensors installed? And what are the challenges that you encountered and how did your team overcome those? Yes, yeah, thank you, good question. Well, we approach it in different ways. The, the first level of sensor deployment, we wanted to strengthen that uh, relationship between Incidime, the, the entity responsible for monitoring, and the Guatemalan National Volunteer Firefighter Community. So what we first proposed is that we would situate sensors in the fire stations, as long as they had power and internet. So that was a real nice way to strengthen that bond. Um, a couple aspects of it, since they're usually located in cities or along highways, on one level, those aren't the best sites for earthquake research because they tend to have a lot of cultural noise. But, for example, like I referred to the town of Las Amatas, what we've done is place sensors in several of the firefighting facilities all along the Motagua Apologic fault system. So even though the sensor sites might not be optimum for recording low magnitude events, they are situated quite nicely in the event of an, a large earthquake to trigger the earthquake early warning system. So that's one level of our site selection. The other part fell more to a collaboration uh, between Hearts in Motion and Incidime for their different, um, since they also watch over meteorology, meteorology in Guatemala, they have several remote sites, so we would consider them also as uh, places to deploy the sensors. In both the cases, either the firefighting group or the Incidime sites, we really didn't have to address the uh, permitting problem and getting permission. Now that aspect of it definitely came into play when we were looking for uh, a site on uh, Volcano Pacaya for the more permanent sensor. And those kind of negotiations are just ongoing, uh, uh, you know, working with the landowner because we want to put uh, not a permanent installation, but we would like to build housing around it. So it is an impact on their land. So it ranges. I, I, hope, the, I hope I answered the question, but the, the part I really liked was this bond between the firefighting community because they're the first responders and just getting them more embedded into the idea of a uh, seismicity monitoring and earthquake early warning system. Great, thanks for that. And as a follow up, you know, you mentioned, Steve, that there was the ability to quickly relocate the raspberry shake sensors in the January 2023 earthquake. Um, how quickly can you relocate these sensors? It is a matter of hours. That's and, great. And, and it's, uh, some very nice components to that because as part of our project, even though there's one part is the volcanism, the other part is the seismicity, we we long from the start of the project, we said if we detect an increase in activity, say on Volcan Pokaya, we can rapidly relocate some of the raspberry shake sensors to to be more focused on that as a hazard. And there was a, a really interesting case that uh, in Sivame did, but uh, in Guatemala City itself, due to the near surface geology, the water runoff, either natural or human induced as to how you do uh, flood drainage, they've had occasions where sinkholes have developed, leading to damage and even loss of life. So in one case, one neighborhood reported feeling uh, tremors and hearing sounds. So we relocated three sensors, uh, again, in a matter of hours, recorded a few months worth of data, and we're going to try to do um, uh, something, you know, I guess, more passive seismicity, maybe some uh, interferometry to see if we can 
gain a foothold on uh, predicting these sinkhole developments. So that was another nice example where we could just rapidly relocate the sensors for a specific purpose. Great, thanks for that. And a question for both of you. Um, what are you looking forward to most in the next phase of your projects? And what are you hoping to accomplish in that next phase? What's what's the goal? And I guess we can start with Elik Plim on that one. Okay, so um, I think that's really the last phase of the project. We are currently running some water quality analysis on the water sample and we are hoping it's good water. But if we do not get good quality water, we are looking at devising a local filtration system that we can attach to the pump. Something that is not too expensive and the locals can easily get materials to maintain the filtration system. So if the water quality results show that we need to do that, then we'll be doing that. Yeah, on the Guatemala project, um, there's many aspects that I enjoy in, in, in working the project, but one part I'm looking forward to is that our GWB funds are uh, supporting three students and their internships within in Sidhame. And part of working with them is uh, they are preparing reports and will be uh, kind of doing summary of their research activities. And I'm looking forward to seeing what comes out of that part of the project as well. Great, thank you. Um, I have a question here for Ellie Plim. Uh, you mentioned a water quality portion of the project, more of a comment, and maybe you've heard of this, but there are new rapid testing kits for E. coli from, I think it says aquagenics that do not require incubation. Um, so that's been successfully used in Uganda. Can you talk a little bit about the water quality testing that you do and how quickly is your turnaround on those results? Okay, so um, I haven't heard about the aquagenic test, but I, I would look at it. So we really um, outsource that to a lab. So there's the, the Ghana National, the National Water Supply Company has um, a lab. So we, we just outsource the testing of the water to them. We do not handle that directly. Okay, and also had a question too um, as a follow on regarding about how deep the basins are in northeastern Ghana. Um, can you talk about any opportunities that the petroleum community could bring in terms of solutions and technology to bear on the geology solutions and access to groundwater? Okay, so the the base the depth of the basin varies. It's actually thickens towards the east. So from the west towards the east, you see it's thickening. And the thickness ranges between five to seven kilometers for um, the thickness of the basin at its thickest point. And currently the Ghana National Petroleum Commission is doing some seismic surveys across the basin, but unfortunately we do not have access to that data. Like I can't really speak much to it, but I know that they are doing some onshore petroleum exploration and probably in the near future we'll be looking for um, partnerships to develop that. But um, unfortunately, I don't have too much information on, on that. Okay, great. I appreciate that. And I'm just going to check the chat and see if there's any additional questions that we were unable to get to. And if anyone has any final questions, you can put them in there. As you're uh, examining the chat uh, relative to the Guatemala project, uh, I'd like to encourage the participants and thank you everyone for, for logging in, but um, the Raspberry Shake sensor has a public data access. If you go to a Raspberry Shake station view, you'll get a world map with all the sensors that are deployed. So the sensors we have in Guatemala are public data. You can. Uh, uh, use the tools on that front end from Raspberry Shake and actually see the data and um, kind of uh, do citizen science on your own. Now on our sensors, we stream the data in two paths. One goes to the public Raspberry Shake server, which is uh, for public consumption. The other one is more real-time into NCIVMA and that's for their uh, earthquake early warning. But uh, I just wanted to bring that up, that the data is available if you want to go 
look at it. It's always interesting. Great. Thanks for that information, Steve. We really appreciate it. Um, well, we don't have any more questions in the chat, so I think we'll we'll go ahead and wrap it there. So if, if people have any questions that um, we did not get to, or if you have questions that, that come up later and you would like to contact the speakers, please go ahead and email us at webinars at americangeosciences.org, and we'll go ahead and pass those uh, questions along to the speakers. And I'd like to thank you again, uh, Steve and Elliot Glim, for taking the time today to share your time and insight and expertise with us. We really appreciate you um, telling us about the projects that you're doing and um, having a great discussion afterwards. So thank you everyone for joining us um, and we look forward to seeing you next time. And this concludes our webinar for today. <laughs>